So the really interesting thing about this dynamical systems approach is that it applies regardless of time scale. So as long as there are rhythmic processes in the, in the brain at a specific time scale, we can expect them to interact with incoming music in the same kind of ways. So let me show you what I mean. So from a frequency of about 8 hertz to frequencies that are slower, we usually call those rhythms. Um, in fact, if you look at a metronome like the ones we were playing with earlier, um, and you uh, just sort of outline their frequency range, it's right in this range here. Okay. If we take an impulse and we repeat it every 500 milliseconds, that's 2 hertz, we get a pulse. Okay. And what's more, subdivisions of pulse, like eighth notes or groupings of pulse like half note or whole note are all in this frequency range. Now if we look at frequencies from 30 hertz up to hundreds and even thousands of hertz, now we're talking about pitch. Same stimulus, different timing, now it's not a rhythm, it's a pitch. And you notice there's a no man's land here in between about 8 hertz and uh, 30 hertz where typically you don't hear in most music uh, that range used. We can listen to what it sounds like anyway. It's not a very pleasant sound. In fact, if, if that sound arose, if that frequency arose from the interaction of sinusoidal stimuli, we'd call it roughness. Um, now, we can, the, the interesting thing that we can do now is we can compare these to the frequencies at which um, the auditory system operates. So at, at cortical frequencies, and we were looking at cortical phase locking for rhythm, uh, we see that the delta band corresponds very nicely with the frequencies we associate with musical pulse. And the theta band corresponds with frequencies that we think of as being sort of subdivisions of the pulse. The alpha and the beta band rhythms of cortex occupy this no, no man's land between rhythm and pitch. And then uh, higher frequency gamma rhythms in the cortex correspond to sort of low pitches. And in the auditory brainstem and the auditory nerve, these have neurons that phase lock to the at the frequencies of pitch. And if we then even think about the cochlea, the auditory peripheral center, the, the part of the uh, periphery that picks up sound, that can phase lock up to tens of thousands of hertz. So what we can do, in fact, is use these ideas to uh, explain things like percepts like pitch, like harmonicity, and stability and attraction. Here we have an experiment I just want to demonstrate for you where we measure the action potentials in an early part of the auditory system in response to some tones. So here I'm going to play you some three sinusoidal tones and then I'm going to actually play the action potentials that we record in the brain through the speakers and you're going to hear something pretty interesting. So high, low, medium tones. Now let's listen to what the brain does with that. So you didn't hear any response to that first tone, but you did hear a response to the second too, and it sounded like that frequency. And that's because those action potentials were actually phase locked on a cycle for cycle basis with the tone. So here's the close-up of the tone, that's a sinusoidal tone, and you get one action potential for every cycle of that tone. That's called phase locking. Mode locking happens too, so we talked about with the rhythm, we talked about 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 2, 4 to 3, and so forth. Here, we actually, it responds to that lower frequency pitch, this neuron, because it produces two action potentials for every cycle of that tone. That's 2 to 1 mode locking, that's the 2 to 1 relationship. So. When we realized this, uh, we came to understand that this kind of mathematics, this kind of physics, could be used to explain how we perceive pitch, how we perceive harmony, how we perceive consonance and dissonance, and even how we perceive and learn about tonality. The idea of mode locking is especially interesting if we look at the history of how musical notes are tuned. 
So going all the way back 2,500 years to Pythagoras, he noticed that frequencies that were tuned to small integer ratios sounded more harmonious. And he came up with a small integer ratio theory to, that he thought explained why those uh, sounds sounded more, more harmonious. He summarized this theory in this diagram, which is called a tetractus, and which shows the relationships between the first four integers, so one, two, three, and four. The unison is the one-to-one. -one. The octave is the two-to-one. So unison, octave, the perfect fifth is three-to-two. And the perfect fourth is four to three. So those low integer frequency ratios correspond to the most consonant musical intervals. It's not a coincidence that those also happen to be the for most stable rhythmic ratios. They're found as polyrhythms in the music of many cultures around the world. And these four particular notes are, all, are found in the musical, music of most cultures around the world. So certainly the unison, the octave is found in virtually every culture around the world, and the three to two and the four to three are found in almost all cultures around the world. So these are the kind of universals that we're talking about when we're talking about um, musical pitch and musical languages. Now, what I want you to do is I want to take you over, I want to introduce you to G. Chul, and he's going to show you how he's using this kind of theory to try and explain how people perceive consonants and dissonance, harmony and implied harmony. Hi, I'm Ji Chul Kim. I'm a postdoc at uh, Music Dynamics Laboratory. I study um, harmony and tonality perception using nonlinear dynamics. And today I'm going to show you neural oscillation provides a natural explanation for pitch-related aspects of music perception, such as consonants and harmony in melody. Musical intervals are categorized as consonants and dissonance, depending on how smooth and pleasant their component tones sound together. It is known, at least since the time of the ancient Greeks, that consonant intervals are related to simple integer ratios. For example, the perfect fifth which is based on a simple integer ratio of 3 to 2. Sounds more consonant than the tritone, which is approximated by a more complex ratio of 45 to 32. We explain the relationship between consonance and frequency ratio in terms of synchronization of nonlinear oscillators. Nonlinear oscillators synchronize to other oscillators by either phase locking in a one-to-one -one ratio, as shown on the left, or by mode locking in an integer ratio, such as the two-to-one ratio, shown on the right. An important property of mode lock synchronization is that mode locking is stronger and more stable for simpler mode locking ratios. This property of mode lock synchronization can be demonstrated with two coupled oscillators. Here, I vary the natural frequency of one oscillator from 220 Hz to 440 Hz, while fixing the natural frequency of the other oscillator at 220 Hz. So the ratio of natural frequencies varies from 1 to 1 to 2 to 1 over time. As shown in the ratio of actual frequencies of the oscillators, or their instantaneous frequencies, the mode of synchronization changes over time as the natural frequency ratio changes. The flat portions of the curve indicate where the oscillators remain locked in one mode locking ratio. As you can see, mode locking region is wider for simple integer ratios such as 1 to 1, 2 to 1, and 3 to 2, which are associated with consonant intervals. Let me play the sound of the oscillators. When the oscillators are mode locked, you'll hear a constant interval over time.
plastic connections between nonlinear oscillators also reflect the relative strength of mode lock synchronization. Here you are looking at the connection matrix for a network of oscillators. The oscillators are tuned to a range of frequencies from 50 to 200 Hz, and all oscillators are coupled to all other oscillators in the network through plastic connections. As you can see in the animation, the plastic connections grow strong between oscillators in simple frequency relationships such as 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, and 3 to 2. The interaction between nonlinear oscillators can also explain the perception of harmony implied in tonal melodies. When you hear a scale or a sequence of melodic steps, you hear a single melodic line moving up or down. This perception is replicated in a network of nonlinear oscillators because oscillators tuned to close frequencies suppress each other. When you hear a series of melodic leaps, each tone leaves a lasting memory trace and you get an impression of harmony even though the tones play one at a time. This perception of harmony is replicated in the oscillator network because the oscillators tuned to not so close frequencies do not suppress each other, but rather resonate together. The distinct behaviors of melodic steps and leaps in oscillator networks can explain important aspects of melodic perception. Compound melody, also called pseudo-polyphony, is a technique of creating multiple melodic lines out of a single line. For example, this solo cello piece by J.S. Bach creates an impression of three simultaneous melodic lines, although only one tone plays at a time. The response of the oscillator network successfully replicates the perception of compound melody. For this Mozart theme, the simulation of the oscillator network shows that the first half of the theme has two simultaneous melodic lines going, which merge into one line in the second half. Hi, my name is Nicole Flegg. I'm currently a graduate student in the Music Dynamics Laboratory here at the University of Connecticut. My main interest is in studying the emotional response we get from music. Previously, you heard about how all of our brains across cultures respond to music in similar ways. My current research looks at how tempo fluctuations, or changes, affect and can actually predict emotional arousal. Emotions can be hard to quantify, but music is a great tool with which to induce emotional responses. Think about it. When you hear a song, do you feel the need to dance, get shivers down your back, maybe cry? You feel emotion. In a past experiment, we had musicians and non-musicians listen to a lovely classical piece by Chopin, played by a pianist the normal way, and played by a machine with all the interesting changes in tempo taken out. We found that not only did the emotion-related areas in the brain light up during the per pianist performed expressive piece, but also, and more interestingly, that the tempo and velocity actually predicted this neural response. Brain activations were synchronized with changes in tempo. Now, we're currently doing a study to see if children with autism will produce the same emotional activation as typically developing children. So I've only had a chance to share a little bit with you about what's going on 
in the Music Dynamics Lab at the University of Connecticut. We're studying rhythm, we're studying pitch, we're studying tonality, we're studying song, we're studying the communication of emotion and even rhythmic synchronization in non-human animals. We'll be making all kinds of materials available on the website. We're going to continue to update it. We'll have papers, we'll have movies, we'll have links. Uh, and we hope that we've inspired you to take a look at what we're doing. What we think our work is showing here is that the brain, it's not sufficient to think of the brain simply as a computer that directs the body in a one-way causal relationship that, is, and that makes this experience of music so mysterious. But rather, the brain and the body are part of the physical world, they resonate to music, and this resonance is complex and it can give rise to emergent processes that maybe as science progresses can begin to explain the structures, the patterns, and perhaps even someday the creativity uh, that we see when we look at music.